Excel review today. So there's going to be no clicker questions because it's all review. First thing to point out is the, the question that's going to be the bigger portion than everything else. Remember, first test, it was on the scientific method. Final exam is going to be the scientific method again. This exam here, it's going to be list, listing all the plants in order, which I expect everyone can do. If you can't, you know, just memorize it. Um, there is the mnemonic. Um, my very anxious mother just served us. My student said nachos would be a good way to end it. Um, I was reading a, an astronomy um, board, and one person was asking, what mnemonic do you use? Somebody responded, well, I just always use Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, <laughs> Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Seemed to work for me. But you do need to have those memorized in order. And then I'm going to ask you about properties. So I might ask you about which ones have a solid surface or which ones have moons or which ones have atmospheres, you know, things like that. Or I could ask you about strength of magnetic field, you know. So there's going to be additional questions about the property that you'll just have to know how all of those plans compare. Very anxious. My, my very educated mother just said that's moons. Okay, that works as well. It used to be my very educated mother just showed us nine planets, but. <laughs> 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 yeah. Because <laughs> she was old school educated. All right. So then we're going through just the different sections, and you've probably already looked at this review thing that's on Moodle. So I'm just going through the review thing that's on Moodle. So from Unit 34. That was our introduction to the solar system. And so it basically had the types of things that we have in the solar system. You obviously need to know the difference between a dwarf planet and a regular planet and the terrestrial versus Jovian planets. Where do I have Jovian here? Jovian planet there. And of course, gas giants are Jovian planets. Um, where you find asteroids, where you find the Kuiper belt, you know, what a comet is, all of those words. What's a superior planet? But it's a planet that's the opposite of an inferior planet, right? Superior planets are planets that are farther away from the sun. Inferior plants are plants that are closer to the sun. And what here? Um, then whatever you're using as a reference point. So we usually use the Earth, but if I say which planets are superior to Jupiter, well, then you'd be using Jupiter as the reference point. Okay, so that's what 34 is. It's just about knowing what's in the solar system and how it got there. Or not how it got there. 35 is how it got there. So 35 is focusing on our theory of how the solar system formed, the whole solar nebula theory. So you need to know the pieces of the solar nebula theory. You have a big cloud of gas. Shock wave hits it. It starts compressing because of conservation of angular momentum. It starts spinning faster. Everything's rotating the same direction because of conservation of angular momentum in the ideal case. Um, make sure you know what this frost line is and what is important about that. The planets all started with condensation, forming planetesimals, which became protoplanets, which then became planets. And then you have the stages of planet formation. So you have differentiation. And then you have <laughs> that's the only one of the stages I see in there. Um, differentiation, and then you have um, the what is it? Cratering, surface flooding, and slow surface evolution. 
So make sure you know those stages of plant formation, they're not all written up there. How do we get the age for our solar system? Okay, that's one of the two ways. And so radiometric dating deals with isotope, half-life, radioactive decay. So all of those things in the top row relate. So make sure you understand how radiometric dating works, that you can calculate, okay, if I have one-eighth of this material left, how many half-lives has it gone through? You should be able to answer that. If I have one-eighth left, how many half-lives has it gone through? How much do you have left after one half-life? Half. How much do you have left after two half-lives? A quarter. How much do you have left after three half-lives? An eighth. There you go. Because it's one half left after each half-life. So we have a half, then half of a half, then half of a half of a half, and so on. Okay, then 36. We talked a little about exoplanets. How do they find exoplanets? We did, I think, uh, some work on this. How do they find exoplanets? A couple different ways. Remember lab? Well, there's one way where like, the planet passes in front of the sun and they measure, like, or from the in front of, of its star, star yeah. yeah. They measure, like, the light, and if the light is, like, a bit of less light, then something must be passing in front of it. Okay, so they measure the light curve, and if you have an eclipsing situation, then you know the planet's on. If you have that eclipsing situation, you can determine exactly what the mass of the planet is and the size, and you can determine almost everything if it's eclipsing, like what Max described. If it's not eclipsing, you saw from your lab work that you can calculate a minimum mass. It has to be at least this mass. And that's using Doppler shifts then. Um, <laughs> these numbers are old. 825 confirmed exoplanets. Um, <laughs> those numbers are a few years old. Those are from 2012. The numbers now are in the, what was it, 3,000 and some. So the numbers have gone up quite a bit since 2012. I should have updated those numbers. I didn't notice them. Okay, then we studied the Earth. Why the Earth? Because, of course, the Earth gives us our best thing to compare to other things. And so we learned that the Earth's crust is primarily silicate, that's silicon and oxygen, plus iron. Why those things? because they condense at high temperatures. Because we're reasonably close to the sun, things that condense at low temperatures, things that basically have a low, um, a low vaporization or even melting point, they're, they're all gonna scale. Those things couldn't stick together in our vicinity. Hence, they couldn't, they couldn't join together by condensation to form our planet in the early stages. It was only in the late stages where our planet was nice and big that it was able to hold on to things with lower um, temperature. That's really beautiful writing, by the way. I'm very proud. Lower constellation temperatures. Know the pieces of the Earth going from the exterior in. You have the crust, then the mantle, then the liquid core, then the solid core, right? That's the layer. The crust is the only thing that really is not really, really uniform. The crust has two types of, of material, the um, continental plates and the oceanic plates. The oceanic plates are more dense and thinner. Continental plates are less dense and thicker. And so then we had the whole plate tectonic motion that's driven by mid-ocean rifts that come up and push the ocean plates apart those ocean plates then when they where they meet the continental plates they subduct why well, i can write a whole story with these words they subduct under causing grinding the grinding causes heating which causes melting so we have volcanoes that form because of that grinding 
we also have it causing stress, which leads to earthquakes. So that whole process, you should know, the Earth's magnetic field is created by the geodynamo effect, which is magnetic dynamo. You have those three pieces to the magnetic dynamo. Swirling material has to be conducting and has to have convection. Yes, Max. Is the, is the convection in, in a, when we're talking about magnetic fields in these planets, is it in the liquid outer core or in the mantle or in a combination? It's in the liquid core. Okay. So the mantle has nothing to do with convection? Oh, um, not with making the geodynamo. Okay. There is convection in the mantle. You might remember pictures that show the mid ocean rifts with convection in the mantle going like this. And so then you have the mid-ocean rifts are moving on those convective circles. But that's not associated with the magnetic field. That's a different thing. So I assume that's where your question comes from. All right. On to 38. We, ought to go, we only have to go to 50. So, you know, we're well on our way here. <clears throat> so next we talked about what's above the earth. We have the hydrosphere, which is the water, covers roughly 70% of the earth. And then we have the atmosphere. And so in the atmosphere, we learned about the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the ionosphere. The ionosphere is ionized way up there. Stratosphere is where our weather occurs. Stratosphere? No, troposphere is where the weather occurs. Stratosphere is the high region above that. So they're, they're in the order that they are layered here. What are Van Allen belts? Okay, those are regions where the magnetic field makes charged particles do cycles. So the charged particles are just going like this, which means that you would have extreme radiation because you just have charged particles flying constantly through you. And I talked about people who believe the United States did not send men to the moon when we said we did in the 60s. I think it was 60s. You, the Russians used this as an explanation that it wouldn't be possible because humans would be killed going through that high radiation zone. And the Americans counter, no, we really did go through the Van Allen belts. They went through that high radiation zone, but they were only in it for about five minutes. So while it was a very high radiation region, it wasn't a long exposure. Still not something that you necessarily want to go through. <sighs> Greenhouse effect. Global warming. Have temperatures on Earth gone up in the last 100 years? They have. They have indeed. The amount of ice dropping is a, is a scary thing. At the same time, we need to have greenhouse gases. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, we would be freezing. Make sure you understand what the greenhouse effect is. What's the most significant greenhouse effect or greenhouse gas? It's water vapor. Water vapor. Then we get to Aldwin's, the methane, because cattle produce lots of methane. As I think I mentioned, Washington State University did the seminal experiments to measure how much methane a cow puts out. Then you get to carbon dioxide. So it's not one of the highest in importance of the greenhouse gases. Why is it the one we always talk about? Yeah, it's the one that humans are largely to blame for. Now, methane, we're also largely to blame for, but that's as a secondary thing from people who eat meat, drink milk. And so it's a lot easier to, uh, to hammer on big, bad, wealthy people than it is on people who like to eat meat. Okay, so we also had... The Milankovitch hypothesis. Remember, we had a homework question about those Milankovitch factors. Things like the amount of radiation the sun gives off, a very large effect on global temperatures. And the sun in the last hundred years has really ramped up the amount of radiation it gives off. Hence, the Earth should have gone through a warming phase just because of that. The sun is now appearing to go through a cooling stage. So if that's what's been driving the warming, the Earth should cool within the next 
20 years or so. So, you know, by the time you guys are my age, it'll be pretty clear if the sun does what we think it is, if humans are responsible or if it's nature that's responsible for that warming trend. Right now, it is, I think, still a matter of conjecture and preference. We don't really know. Um, the other Milankovic factors were things like the, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit because of interactions with other planets sometimes were more eccentric, sometimes less. The tilt of our axis right now, we're tilted 23 and a half degrees because of the planetary interactions, it actually varies between about 24 and 22. So we're on the more tilted edge, which makes our seasons more extreme, which lends itself to warming. There's the, uh, the time of year when the Earth is closest to the sun. Right now it's in early January. Um, there are, all of these factors go together and have been used to predict global temperatures and they match very well historically and of course predict right now that the earth should have been going through a warming stage. So the Milankovitch hypothesis kind of stands in contradiction to the, the narrative that it's man's fault. The thing is it could still be partially man's fault just because it should be warming up. It could be warming up more than it should be. And of course I was just reading a, discussion about this today. As Christians, it's our responsibility to care for this earth. Whether man is causing warming or not, we need to be responsible, not pollute, and so on. I, that's my belief. That's not going to be on the test. <laughs> okay. Remember the Coriolis effect? Sure you do. The earth has a faster surface speed if you're at the equator, slower surface speed if you move toward the poles. So if something like a packet of air moves from the equator toward the pole, compared to the surface of the Earth, it's going to start deviating in the direction the Earth is rotating, which means it'll start deviating to the east, which is why when you're flying from here to, to let's say, Hong Kong, it's much faster, much less time going one direction than the other because you're flying either with that wind that's created by the Coriolis effect are against it. Uh, I did not spend much time talking about glaciation or erosion, so I'll not focus on those. Aurora, remember Aurora Australis, which one is that? South, south right. Australis is south. Aurora Borealis, north. So the northern lights, the southern lights, which are caused by particles from the sun coming and be, being directed by the Earth's magnetic field toward the poles. They come into the Earth's atmosphere. They excite the electrons and atoms. The electrons de-excite and give off light. Uh, finally, to the moon, moving away from the Earth. The moon is, it has the mare or maria. Maria is plural of mare, which are the seas because they thought that they were seas. But it turns out they're not. They are just nice flat regions where flooding with magma has created a nice smooth surface. You also have the highlands where you have lots of impact craters. Regolith is the name given to most of the rock on the moon. It's because it's basically been powdered by lots and lots of little impacts because of all of the debris that creates a meteor shower on Earth. There's no atmosphere for it to burn up in on the moon, so it actually hits the surface of the moon. And so it's like the surface of the moon is being sandblasted all the time, creating that regolith. Um, yeah, make sure you understand the other words here. The tidally locked is an important feature. It's tidally locked, so the same side always faces us. Although you might remember that word libation. It has just a little bit of rocking if you view it from Earth, and that's because its orbit is not perfectly circular. Not perfectly circular, sometimes it's closer to the Earth and moving faster because of Kepler's third law. Third law? Second law. Sometimes farther away and moving slower, and its rotation rate has to remain constant because of conservation of angular momentum. And so that's why it has that rocking action that we call libation. 
Mercury. Mercury looks a lot like the moon. It's different in that it has a, <clears throat> a bigger gravity, which means that it has not as steep of, Mercury did have bigger gravity, yeah, not as steep of craters. It has those scarps that are long cracks that we believe are signs that it has shrunk under cooling. But it does have a very weak magnetic field, which indicates that it's not completely frozen in the core. Shocking to scientists when they found that out a few years ago. Uh, Messenger is the satellite that most recently studied it just a few years back. Mariner 10 was our original information. What is most unique about Mercury? Yeah. Okay. It has its three to two orbital resonance. That is, it does three rotations in the time for two orbits. And so as a result, I believe it was what one and a third orbit makes a day. And so it's, yeah, it's very weird. And that's all because it's tidally locked as close as it can be. Because it has a very eccentric orbit compared to ours, or compared to the moon around the Earth, I mean, it can't just have one side always facing the sun. And so it's done the next best thing. So it has a three to two resonance. So every other time it comes around it, facing the sun, then facing away from the sun, then facing the sun again is what it's doing. So it's a resonance similar to our moon, but because of the eccentricity, it can't be locked the same. Venus, not many words to learn on Venus, but its most unique feature is this retrograde spin. It actually spins backward with its time for it to do one spin, similar to its time to do one orbit. So it has about two days in a year because it's spinning the opposite direction. Very weird. It has those pancake domes, which are similar to, we believe, the shield volcanoes like the Hawaiian Islands on Earth. Uh, it has signs of faults. It's called the Earth's twin because it's just a little bit smaller than the Earth. But the difference between Venus and Earth is like the difference between you know, heaven and hell. Venus is very hot because it has a very thick atmosphere, has a runaway greenhouse effect. Runaway greenhouse effect, lots of sunlight comes in, very little radiation gets out, and so the temperature has gotten very hot. Does Venus have a planet-wide magnetic field? No. So it doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field. What conclusion could we draw from this? There are three possible. One is that it doesn't have a molten core. Number two is that it doesn't have convection in that molten core. Number three is that it's not rotating fast enough. Computer models say it is rotating fast enough. The fact that it's like 90, what, 93, 96% the size of the earth means it definitely should still have a molten core. Only the small things should be frozen. And so, what was that? And so that's what we conclude. It must not have convection. So that's a conclusion. It's not a, a known fact, but it's the conclusion because we can pretty much rule out the other two. Then we get to Mars. Mars is smaller than the Earth and Venus. Being smaller, we believe its, mag its core is completely frozen. It doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field but you can see the bones of a planet-wide magnetic field. That is, you can find frozen into the surface regions where it used to have a magnetic field. And so it's got regional magnetic fields. And so they believe it used to have a planet-wide magnetic field. It stopped, it's still rotating plenty fast. And so it must be frozen, it's the conclusion. It has the tallest mountain on 
in the solar system, I almost said on Earth, tallest mountain in the solar system in Olympus Mons. What's unique about Olympus Mons, besides being like almost twice as tall as the otherwise tallest mountain, is that there is no, no crushing down caused by that very heavy mountain. On Earth, our tallest mountain, Mauna Kea, has a moat around it because it's sunk down deeper into the mantle because of the heavy load. But that hasn't happened on Mars, which leads scientists to believe that Mars must have a very hard shell, no current plate tectonics. They believe it used to have plate tectonics. Things like the Valles Marineris, they believe was created in a similar fashion to plate tectonics um, motion. But Olympus Mons tells us it no longer is soft. Yeah. How large, or like how much taller would our tallest mountain be if it wasn't so heavy and so heavy? If what? If our tallest mountain didn't sit in. Um, I believe, okay, I'm probably going to be wrong, but it seems to me it's like more than a mile deep, the moat. Um, so it'd be like a mile or two taller. But I don't know the number off the top of my head. I'm going on a vapor memory. It does have polar caps, just like Earth. It's tilted 24 degrees. And so it forms ice caps on its poles. The... Uh, the two moons, Phobos, Fear, and Deimos, Terror, twin brothers, they don't look anything like our moon. They look like asteroids. Why? Because they're probably captured asteroids. Now, going back to Mercury, Mercury has a density that's very high. And scientists have concluded that it's high density is because it must have had a collision that knocked away a lot of the mantle material, leaving it with a lot more of the core material, which is the more dense material because of differentiation. I forgot to mention that when I went over it. All right. Chapter 43, asteroids. Where do we find asteroids? Largely What are the planets inside and outside of the asteroids? Yes, largely Mars and Jupiter. That's a J. Looks like an M because I was thinking M, but J. So they're between Mars and Jupiter or between the terrestrial and Jovian planets. Is it because the frost line's in that region? No, it's not. Why is it there then? It's believed probably because of Jupiter's super large mass stopping anything from continuing to grow in that region and leaving us with a bunch of, of stunted growth objects. So we have the asteroid belt. Bode's rule was a very interesting rule that was a mathematical equation that set where each one of the planets, including Ceres as a dwarf planet, lie. And it's really pretty reliable. But there is no known reason for Bode's rule. Hence, scientists consider it just a, a coincidence because we don't have any reason for it to be there. If we don't have a reason, we don't deny it, but we don't give it credence as, well, that's a hard and fast rule because we don't have any reason why we should believe it's a hard and fast rule. The Kirkwood gaps, what causes the Kirkwood gaps in the asteroids? We had a homework problem on those. We had to calculate where the Kirkwood gaps are using orbital resonance, things like a two to one period ratio or three to one ratio of periods. And those ratios cause anything in that orbit to have a repeatable tug that makes their orbits become more eccentric. As the orbits become more eccentric, they start crossing paths with other things, increasing the likelihood of collisions, which will then cause them to fall into a new orbit, 
So you can't have stable orbits with those radii because of resonance. So that's what the Kirkwood gaps are. I didn't focus on near earth objects at all. Near earth objects are objects that could collide with the earth. They are a concern and astronomers keep very close tabs on all of them they know about. Of course, every now and then there's one that flies. Like I remember one flying one fifth of the distance between the earth and the moon away from the earth. And it was only discovered after it had passed. We, we have a hard time finding these little things. And so, you know, movies became famous. So it was what, a decade ago now when they had all the movies about an asteroid hitting the earth. For the most part, we don't have any warning because we don't find them in time. But we do know of a lot of near earth objects, objects that are in the vicinity of the earth and we track their orbits very carefully because if we're going to collide with something we want to know about ahead of time, you know, so we can bury our heads in the sand or whatever the appropriate response is before you die. This is an important thing to know about the asteroid belt. You put all of those little chunks together and it's less than 1% the mass of the earth. We think of the asteroid belt as just being this thick cloud of asteroids, but no, it's mostly empty space. And so it's no problem trying to get a ship to navigate through the asteroid belt. Um, note some asteroids have their own moons. There's only one asteroid that is considered a dwarf planet, that's Ceres, and it comprises, what was it? Something like a third of all of the mass of the asteroids is in that one object, Ceres. Okay, let's move on. We did, we did a lab thing on comparative planetology, comparing the properties of the planets. And that is what we're going to have basically for the question, you name all the planets, and then you're going to have to do a comparison between the properties of the planets. So, you know, that is something to try to know well, just so you can, can relate for the comparison. Oblateness is how deformed it is from spherical in shape. The terrestrial planets are not very deformed. They're pretty spherical. But the Jovian planets, because they don't have a solid surface, they tend to be quite oblate. Most oblate is Saturn because it has the rings. Jupiter and Saturn spin really quickly. How long is a day on Jupiter? Okay, it's, it's something just over 11, maybe 11.9 Earth day or Earth days, Earth hours. And Saturn is something like nine and a half Earth hours. Actually, maybe it was 11.2 because I think they were closer than. So they're both in the ballpark of 10, which is what Max said, with Jupiter having the, the longer day, Saturn the shorter day. So they're spinning really rapidly. And they have belt zone circulation patterns. Belts being the regions that are pulled in, the zones being the regions that are out, the belts being the darker regions, the zones being the lighter regions. Because of the Coriolis effect, you have winds going opposite directions in the belts versus the zones. And so there are regions with high wind speeds and at the borders between them, you have winds going opposite direction, which creates cyclonic storms such as the Great Red Spot, which has been there as long as man has been observing Jupiter with telescopes. Galileo discovered the Great Red Spot. Contrary to the kinds of things you read in internet memes, that doesn't mean the Great Red Spot began its existence when Galileo first observed it. I, I saw something where people were saying, well, it's a straw man argument because it's putting a false statement and then saying those people need education. <laughs> that uh, I'd rather go um, an hour without oxygen than a minute without God because God's been for here forever and oxygen wasn't invented until 17 something. <laughs> yeah. Obviously that's false. And I doubt anybody actually said that. I think that somebody made it up so that they could mock people who believe in God, like I do. Um, <clears throat> why is liquid metallic hydrogen important for Jupiter?
Should I not ask questions? Not this one. <laughs> it's a good answer. Um, it's important because that's what makes the magnetic field. You have the swirling and convection of the liquid metallic hydrogen that is out above the water layer in Jupiter because it's less dense than water that scientists believe make its very, very strong magnetic field. Um, Cassini was a, a satellite that explored Jupiter measuring the gases. It has differential rotation which means that it doesn't rotate at the same rate at the equators it does at the poles. In this case, it rotates faster at the poles, slower at the equator. Just the opposite of the sun we'll learn, right? The sun is what we'll start next week. So that's another interesting thing. Only a, a non-solid planet can have differential rotation. Okay, next, I don't even, oh yeah, Saturn. What's different between Saturn and Jupiter? The, okay, the ring. That's about it. Otherwise, it's just a matter of scale. Saturn is not as massive. Jupiter is like 300 times the mass of Earth, and Saturn's only 100 times the mass of Earth. <laughs> They're both really massive, really large. They make up the vast preponderance of all non sun mass in the solar system. The sun, of course, is the preponderance of all mass in the solar system. <laughs> so, if you understand Jupiter, you understand Saturn, except for the rings. So we have 47 there is on the ring. So I won't go on the rings right now until we get there. So Saturn still has belt zones, still has differential rotation. As with all gas giants, they are giving off more heat than they absorb from the sun. So they're still cooling from formation. So then Uranus and Neptune, they're the ice giants. So if I ask you that lame question, where are the ice giants? I don't want to hear you say, you know, any fantasy land. The ice giants are out beyond the orbit of Saturn because they're, I don't want to hear that. So the, the ice giants are Uranus and Neptune. What's to me most interesting about Uranus and Neptune is the discoveries. Uranus discovered in the traditional way, but then looking at, Uranus's orbit, they said that doesn't match what it should be just from the other known planets. And so based on its orbit, there was predicted to be another planet. They looked and found that planet. So that one's called Neptune. And then looking at the orbit of Neptune, they said, this doesn't look right either. They predicted another planet. They looked and they found Pluto, but they really quickly realized that while Neptune really did have the properties that they were looking for, Pluto didn't. Pluto was nowhere close to the properties necessary to cause the variation in the orbits. And eventually they discovered that it was relativity effects that were causing the oddness in Neptune's orbit and there was no need to have another planet. I did read up, Gabby, about the uh, a proposed ninth planet. And it once again is just a proposal that um, they were talking about the the orbits in the solar system being kind of of corkscrewing and they said well that could be explained if there's another planet we don't know about that's got these crazy properties and it's it's actually mark brown the person who's discovered all of these objects like eris qualwar make make that is proposing this but it's still just a proposal it's not actually there's been an observation there You have the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is on its side. Very interesting thing to note. I could ask you about, you know, the direction they rotate. If I ask you about direction of rotation, all but two of them are normal prograde rotation. Which two are not prograde? Venus, because it essentially orbits or rotates backward very slowly. And Uranus, because it's tipped what 97 degrees so it's basically on its side so you would say you know normal 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 goes backward normal normal on its side if that was the question um 
their colors come from just the amount of methane in the atmosphere. Slightly different amounts of methane gives them slightly different absorption of red and thus slightly different colors. <coughs> their magnetic fields are wacky. They change a lot. They're not centered on the planets. They're highly inclined, right? The earth is inclined like 11 degrees. We've got like 60 degrees in, I think it's Neptune. And so as scientists look at those magnetic fields, they say, okay, they have planet-wide magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are stronger than the Earth's. So they must have a conducting material that's swirling around and has convection. But the question is, what is it? It doesn't have liquid metallic hydrogen. How do we know? Because computer models say it can't get the high enough temperature and pressure to produce it. And so the conclusion is it must have kind of a briny water that's swirling around with rocks of ice and the motion of the water and the ice is what's creating the magnetic fields. And because of the unpredictable nature of water and ice swirling, that's why you have the really weird magnetic fields. So that's the scientific conclusion. Maybe someday we'll find out differently and modify the hypothesis to get some things better. Now we get to satellites and rings. Satellites, also known as moons, you have only a few that are like the Earth's moon. You have one for the Earth, four for Jupiter, and then what is it? One for Saturn and one for Neptune? something like that. There's not that many of them. And of those, a number of them are larger than Mercury. So the largest, what is the largest of the moons? First is Ganymede and then Titan. So Ganymede's the largest than Titan. We spent some time looking at the moons of Jupiter. The moons of Jupiter are very interesting. We have Io, which is basically hell with its sulfur and being worked by tidal forces so that it has sulfur um, volcanoes. You have Europa, which is a young ice surface with evidence for water underneath. So scientists believe that's a really likely place for life to be in the waters underneath the surface. You go out and um uh oh order it's so next one Callisto, then ganymede yeah i think so and so Callisto is similar to europa but thicker ice less water and then the last one ganymede is frozen all the way through and they believe only partially differentiated then we get to the rings which planets have rings All of the gas ones do. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have rings. Three of them are not like the fourth. Saturn is the unique one. Saturn has ice particles in its rings. Those ice particles range from the size of houses down to little tiny grains. Depends on where you are in the rings, what the size is. The rings around the other three are small little grains of dusty type stuff with carbon soot on them. And so the scientific conclusion is that the rings of Saturn occurred because a comet came inside its Roche limit and got shredded by tidal forces forming the rings. Whereas the others, an asteroid came inside the Roche limit and got shredded. Now it would have to be a, an asteroid that was pretty much held together by gravity there are asteroids living inside the Roche limit, living inside the rings. And so you have what they call um, shepherd moons that are asteroids that are shepherding these rings, making, we saw last class period, the pretty little braided, braided ring where we have material that, that's the wrong color. They look something like this and then repeated. So it was, you know, like the materials going around itself being braided. 
And that's because of shepherd moons, which are asteroids that have been bonded together, essentially melted and frozen, so that they aren't torn apart by the tidal forces. Did you have a question or was that purely stretching? <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure I don't, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. What is the Cassini division? It's the big gap in the ring of Saturn. The Cassini division is the big gap. Um, the small one, I can't remember. We had it last class period, but my memory doesn't go back that far. So those are caused, the Cassini division and the other smaller one are caused by orbital resonance, just like the Kirkwood gaps. Okay, getting down to the very end, we had the ice worlds. What's a trans-Neptunian object? Something that's semi-major axis is far is larger than the semi-major axis of Neptune. So something that orbits, on average at least, beyond Neptune. We have Plutinos. Plutinos are things that have a three to two orbital resonance with Neptune. Why are they called Plutinos? Because Pluto is a Plutino. It's the largest one. It has a three to two orbital resonance. It hasn't cleared its region. So there's lots of other objects in that same three to two resonance pattern like Pluto. Pluto, even though it crosses inside and comes back out of Neptune's orbit, it will never collide with Neptune because of that three two orbital resonance. Um, we have our dwarf planets here that we should no, there's only five of them, Ceres, Pluto, Eris, Makemake, and Haumea. So it's not very hard to know all five of them. Of those, which is the largest? No? Mark Brown discovered it. You wanted to name it Xena, the warrior princess but wasn't a god, so it's Eris. Eris is the largest of the dwarf planets. Make sure you know the definition of what's a dwarf planet. So it has the two pieces, or well, a planet has two pieces. It has to be enough mass to bring itself into a spherical shape, and it has to have cleared its orbit. Now there is a third thing, it has to orbit the sun, but I think we could take that as a given. Um, the, the reason I give that is that's going to kind of rule out, for instance, the moon, because the moon is not orbiting the sun, it's orbiting the earth, which is orbiting the sun. And so Eris is not a planet. Pluto is not a planet. Haumea, Makemake, um, Ceres, they're all not planets because they're big enough that gravity has brought them into a spherical shape, but they haven't cleared out their neighborhoods. Okay, last page, two minutes. I actually nailed the time on this. Comets. Halley's Comet comes around about every 77 years, 76, 77 years. It's very repeatable. And it's, well, you had a homework problem. You had, you have a homework problem due Wednesday. Did I mention I will not be able to be in my office hours today? You did not. I will not be able to. I knew that you were counting on me, Aldwin. I should be back by four. I should be back by four. Okay. Um, Max has a question. Um, did you, like you said that we're not going to be tested over things that you didn't get to in lecture, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So did you get to 48 or 49? Um, I, I got to 49. Okay. I did not get to 50. Okay. So we have the comets and the comet has it's nucleus, which is an ice, ice ball, ice and dirt, basically. It varies from one comet to the next. But the comets are just Kuiper belt or Oort cloud objects, depending on the short period comets are Kuiper belt. The longer period comets are Oort cloud. The Oort cloud comets, those things come in at crazy angles. The Kuiper belt ones come in in the same plane as the orbit of the planets. 
when they're far away from the sun, they're just icy objects. But when they get close to the sun, the sun is causing them to sublimate, going from solid to gas, and they're losing mass. So that's why you have the whole problem about how much mass Halley's Comet loses each time around the sun. Thus, how many orbits can it survive before it's going to disappear, just be broken apart? Um, these comets, because they're blowing off a lot of debris in two tails, the ion tail, which points directly away from the sun, the dust tail, which points mostly away from the sun, but doesn't interact as strong with the solar wind, so it's kind of trailing, those leave debris. And when the Earth goes through this debris, like it did this past week, then we have a meteor shower. And so meteor showers are mostly just tiny little pieces of debris the size of a grain of sand coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And then they get hot, they get ionized, they interact with gas as they pass by, don't have to collide once it's ionized, excite the electrons in the gas, the electrons fall down to lower energy states, give off light. We call that light the meteor. So meteor is the light we see flying through the sky. Meteorite is the rock that hits the earth. Obviously, grains of sand don't hit the earth. They burn up in the atmosphere. So the meteorites are pretty much exclusively asteroids, whereas the meteors are vast, vast majority the debris left over from a comet. Meteoroid is an object that's going to come in and become a meteor. And we're out of time.